let's just pray. Um, you know, you can turn to Ephesians 6. We're going to be looking at the armor of God, so starting in verse 10. But let's just, let's just pray. Hmm. Lord, I thank you for what you are doing in our midst this morning. And Jesus, we just want to stay in that place, in that sweet place. I thank you that there is so much truth in this book of Ephesians that we have taken hold of and that we have grasped. And as we look at this final passage, I just pray that you would continue to minister to our hearts, continue to speak truth into our hearts and into our minds and continue to transform us more into your likeness, that we can be you to the world around us and we can be fully who you have made us and called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Great, so Gideon has very kindly got those slides up. So we're in Ephesians 6, verse 10. We're gonna do right to the end, but I've broken it up into three sections that we're gonna look at piece by piece. So we're gonna start with the first two verses. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Poof, it's a pretty big one. So in nearly every good story, there's an element of good versus evil, right? In all of our favorite films that we watch, you know, we have the hero and the villain. We have the enemy and the, you know, the goody. And I was thinking about this. I was thinking about my, some of my favorite films where you see this in action. Tim referred to Lord of the Rings. I mean, classic. It's a great one. But I'm a bit of a Marvel girl myself. I kind of like a bit of... A bit of Spider-Man. Who likes Spider-Man? <laughs> I love Spider-Man. He is seriously a cool superhero. Have you seen, have you seen the modern film where he's, uh, he does this? <laughs> and like the thing comes out of his wrist and, and he's able to swing between kind of the high-rise buildings in Manhattan. I mean, it's seriously cool. I would love to be able to do that. Just be able to stand at the top of the building and and be able to swing between them. That would be awesome. Anyway, Spider-Man is obviously against the Green Goblin. That's his arch enemy. And he wins, of course. He defeats the evil one. Um, but when we look at these images, just go on to the next one. Yep, that's them in battle. We think, of, we think about a battle, we think about a battlefield, and we just think, you know, of the blood and the gore. You know, either in this or in kind of... I don't know, war movies, we think about the blood and the gore, we think um, about mass destruction. You know, in those, in those amazing Hollywood films where they use CGI and the buildings come crashing down and it's just like the whole of Manhattan is destroyed. The, the, the buildings all come tearing down and it's just mass destruction. It's very, very dramatic. And Paul says that we're in a battle. But how many of us see that in our daily lives? You know, is this, what, is this what it looks like when we kind of go about our everyday ordinary lives? Do we see buildings crashing down around us? Now, I mean, I reckon actually if we lived in Africa and we spoke to someone like Heidi Baker, she'd probably say, yeah. Actually, in the spiritual, I do see that all the time. You know, we're living amongst witch, witchcraft and witch doctors and people give their lives to Jesus and we see the physical battle we see it with our eyes. We can see the, the, the battle that it is to get them out of that and into the kingdom and the repercussions on family life as people give their lives to Jesus. But in the West, I guess there may be a rise in an openness to spirituality. We've seen, you know, Light in Life do an amazing ministry. You know, so reaching out to people who have their eyes open to the spiritual world. But actually here in the West, um, you know, there's a lot of apathy about spirituality. And I think one of the tricks of the enemy is to make people think that there is no spiritual reality. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, Paul says, the God of this age, 
which is the enemy, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. I think if he can make people think that God doesn't exist and that he doesn't exist, then he can have an absolute field day. Because we think that our, our fight is against flesh and blood and we see things in the natural and we think it's against flesh and blood when actually there's a whole spiritual dimension going on. And if he can make us think actually it's just about flesh and blood, then he can have an absolute field day. And I think similarly for the best part of our day-to-day -day lives as Christians, the battleground is much more subtle than what we see in the Marvel films. It's much more subtle. But the reality is, my friends, that the enemy is at work. And the more that we love God, and the more that we want to do things for his kingdom, and the more we advance his kingdom here on earth, the more the enemy will not like it. In John 12, Jesus calls the enemy the prince of this world. And in 1 Peter 5, verse 8 to 9, he says, Be alert and of sober mind, because your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. So although we know that Christ ultimately defeated Satan, didn't he, on the cross, he has been ultimately defeated, and his days are numbered. He is at work still here in this world, and he can only be in one place at one time, but he gathers kind of the demons and the spiritual forces around him um, to, to be at work. And therefore, we must take our stand and put on the full armor of God. Now, I think, you know, we can say these things, and it can all seem a bit scary, can't it? Um, but I want to say, and we're going to come back to this in a minute, that actually there is nothing to fear because God does, there is, you know, God has the authority and, and we have the authority under, under Jesus and we're going to come back to that. So although we start in that stark reality and that somber reality that we are in a battle, let us not fear. And let's take a look at the armor that God has given us so that we can be prepared. So verses 13 to 17, it says, therefore... Put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after, after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, which with, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's some pretty cool armor, isn't it? And we're going to go through each of the pieces of the armor. And we're going to look at them one by one and kind of work out what it is um, that they do for us and why we need to use them. But as I was praying, as I was asking God about this passage, I really felt like he spoke about two pieces of armor that we particularly really need to hear this morning as a congregation. And so I'm going to focus on two. I'm going to leave you lingering to see which one it is. Um, but we're going to focus more on two. Um, and we're just going to kind of delve into those a bit more. Um, but we, we are going to look at each one. So number one, gird your loins with truth. I just love this translation. I mean, it says put on the belt of truth, you know, in a lot of versions, but I love this. Gird your loins with truth. Say to your neighbor, gird your loins with truth. So, so the phrase gird your loins comes from the Bible, and it means to prepare and strengthen yourself for what is to come. And it came from the idea that basically the Roman soldiers would be wearing tunics, okay? They'd be wearing long, kind of loose clothing. And if they were going to go into battle, actually it would be pretty hard to maneuver in this. They wouldn't be able to move very quickly. And they wouldn't be able to be very agile because they had, they had this long kind of clothing. And so what this meant was hitch up your tunic, hitch up, gather it, and secure it with a belt so that you can be agile. Fun fact. So the belt would be used basically as the first piece of armor that someone needed to put on before they put on the rest of the armor to gather the tunic up, 
secure it round, and to hold it all together. And it would give them a sense of real security and agility. But the belt would also have a, a, a pocket or like a, you know, a, a, a part in it that basically the sword could go in. And it would also have a bit where the identity papers, some, some would say the identity papers can be held as well. And we all know the sword of the spirit, we're going to come to it in a bit. But what is this, the spirit of? The spirit of truth, yeah. The spirit of truth, which is the word of God, which gets locked with the belt of truth. So those two go together. And the fact actually that there was a place for the identity papers, I think, is really significant. Because actually, as I was kind of like meditating on this and just wrestling on this, I felt like God was saying, actually, that our identity, first and foremost, who we are and whose we are, is so important to know and be confident in as we face into the battle. And actually, the enemy would attack our identity massively in help making us kind of be insecure in who we are or whose we are or, you know, or, or what God has done for us. And I came across this picture, just have a look. My friend posted this on Facebook, and I just thought, I love that. And it said, fear nothing in front of you because of who is behind you. And you can just imagine this cub being faced with something and thinking, yeah, you know, they're afraid of me because I'm tough. And then actually he looks behind and says, oh, actually, it's just because my dad's there, you know. They're actually afraid of him, really, not me. But we can, we, we can fear nothing. We, 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 you know, because of who is behind us and whose we are, because God is on our side. In Luke 10, 17 to 20, um, the seven, it says, the 72 returned with joy and said, so they're saying to Jesus, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the en enemy, nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And you can kind of imagine them coming back, can't you, and being like, woo, did you see what just happened? Did you see what, you know, those demons submitted in the name of Jesus, that is so cool, that is so awesome. And Jesus says, you know, it's amazing, but let us get more excited about the fact that it's because of who you are and whose you are. It's because we belong to God and actually we have the authority in him because we are his sons and daughters. So the because of who you are always comes first. And if we forget it, if we forget what our identity is and we try and do things on our own strength, actually we're just going to completely be wiped out and so the first one the belt of truth that goes on before anything else that's the truth of our identity and him is so important when I was younger I used to actually get really really scared I used to get really scared of the dark but I also used to get quite scared because I'd be in places or spaces and it would be like I'd actually sense kind of what was, like, I'd sense some evil or some darkness, yeah? And when I was young, I really didn't know what to do with that because I could sense it, I could feel it, and I actually, I was just terrified. I was petrified of it. And it wasn't really until I understood the authority that I had in Jesus that I thought, actually, you know, he says, you don't have to fear, nothing can harm you because you have the authority in Jesus. And so that's really important that we take hold of. So that's gird your loins. Actually, I reckon that would be really good in a Scottish accent, wouldn't it? Who has it? Oh, I'm gonna, who has a Scott? Go on, I wanna hear it. Gird your loins. Oh yes, your beauty, love it. Okay, so we're gonna go on to the second one. The breastplate of righteousness. Okay, say to your neighbor, put on the breastplate of righteousness. So the breastplate basically covered a soldier's heart and other really vital organs. You know, you know that it goes here, so it covers the heart and, and all the really other vital organs. And when I was um, studying anatomy, um, before I learned how to do massage, 
Who knew that? Fun fact. I can do massage. Now I'm going to be getting like all of these requests. But when I was doing anatomy, I had to learn about the heart. I mean, you kind of learn all the basic stuff as well as some of the more complicated stuff. But the heart, as we know, is a muscle. And it's about the size of a fist. And every day, your heart beats around 100,000 times. Amazing, right? 100,000 times. Now, we're not aware of it. It just happens in our subconscious. Um, but that's what, the, the, that's what the heart does. And it's the most vital organ in our body because physically it pumps blood around the body and in that it transports the oxygen and the nutrients to the cells throughout our body. And then it takes the waste away um, and, and, and gets rid of that as well. And so I was thinking, okay, that's what physically what the heart does and it's really important and that's probably why we need to really protect it you know, in battle because obviously you get jabbed and you get killed straight away. But as I was thinking about it, I was thinking there's so much more to the heart than this just, you know, that it just pumps blood around the body. You think about all the phrases. I was like listing all the phrases that I could think of where we, where we use the word heart. It's just, you know, we ask whether someone has their heart in the right place. We're not meaning, do, do they have it on the left-hand side of the body? Is it in the right place or is it here in the knee? Because that's in the wrong place. We don't mean that when we say whether someone has their heart in the right place. We mean, you know, are their intentions good? Or we say, wow, so-and-so has ra really had a change in heart, haven't they? Have they had a heart transplant? Oh, no, obviously that's not what we mean. We mean, you know, that, you know they've actually changed their mind. You know, they've had a change of heart. And I listed them to have your heart set against something, to have your heart set on something, to not have your heart in something, to lose heart, to take something to heart, to pour your heart out, to tug at someone's heartstrings, to wear your heart on your sleeve, and to have a heavy heart. That's just a few phrases, isn't it, where we talk about the heart. And we're not meaning the heart that pumps the blood around the body, we're meaning so much more of who we are. And I was really thinking about the heart and I was thinking, do you know, this is a really, really important piece of armor that we need to wear. Because, you know, prior to the advancements in science, when we knew that the emotions actually are in our brain, they're in our mind, they're not in our heart, people thought that they were in the heart. And why did they think they were in the heart? Because actually, when things happen, we actually can feel like we've got a heavy heart, can't we? It can feel really heavy. And it's because we're all kind of you know, linked up and things actually happen physiologically that actually mean that it pumps things to the heart, it pumps adrenaline to the heart, and actually we can carry these things in our heart. And it's not just feelings. I was thinking about, I was thinking, where do I think maybe my hopes and my dreams are stored? I feel like they're in my heart, yeah? Where do I hold the relationships in my life? I feel like I hold them in my heart. I give my heart to people. Where do I hold my identity? I kind of feel like part of my identity is, is stored there in my heart. My desires. So many things that you could talk about, it feels like they are stored in the heart. And so although we know that the heart like, only has four chambers, actually, as I, was, as I was thinking about the heart, I felt like God gave me a, this, the picture of, next one, Gideon. Who knows where that is? Who knows what that is? Downton Abbey, yeah. <laughs> I thought, oh, I, th I, had a heart, I had a picture of a mansion, and I thought, well, what's the coolest mansion? Actually, people probably love Downton Abbey. I'll get a picture of Downton Abbey up. But I had this picture of the heart, this heart as a mansion. And mansions have many, many, many rooms, don't they? They have wings, and they have many rooms. And I felt like, actually, some of these things that we're talking about, the hopes and the dreams, some of all of the relationships in our lives, imagine them as rooms in our heart. Imagine them as rooms in a mansion. Now, some of these rooms in this mansion are public rooms. You know, anyone can walk around and go there. They can be in the lobby and they can be in the lounge. They kind of access all the areas. And I think these are the things in our heart which are pretty public. They're on display. People can see you know, who you've given your heart to, you get married, and so people see that that's a key relationship in your life. And 
And you know, some of your hopes and dreams are public. You're kind of walking out your hopes and dreams. But then I felt God also say that actually there are some rooms in our heart that are pretty private. Actually, sometimes we have some hopes and desires that we don't share with anyone except God. Or maybe we just share with one other person that we really trust and that we really know. And maybe some things in our relationships are more private than others. And so there are some rooms that are kind of more private suites. There are some rooms that are more public suites, but they're all stored there in our heart. Now, I want us to think about what happens when we have negative experiences in relation to these things in our heart. Let's have a think about hopes and dreams. What happens when we don't see those be fulfilled? Or we wait on them for a really, really long time, and then you know, we're still waiting to see that thing happen? I think that sometimes we can feel this sense of disappointment and it affects our heart, doesn't it? Or you take a situation where you know, you've got a friendship where actually you've been hurt or betrayed by that friend. And what happens then? Or you might experience rejection in a relationship or in a situation. And what happens then? Now let's think about this in relation to the passage and the idea that we're in a battle and we need to protect our heart. Because I don't think necessarily that the devil creates these situations. You know, we live in a broken world. We live in a world where we're full of sin and that others are full of sin. That we obviously ask forgiveness, but we're not perfect. And so we can hurt each other, right? And so although the enemy doesn't necessarily create these situations, I think he definitely uses them. It's like he'll go, oh, do you know what, I'm gonna work with that material that I've got, and I'm gonna, you know, and I'm gonna take them down because of it. So, you know, he might use the disappointment in our lives and in our hearts from unanswered prayer or, you know, or unfulfilled dreams to make us start questioning God's promises or his goodness or his faithfulness. Or he might use a situation where we've been hurt or betrayed by a friend to cause a broken relationship or, you know, even worse still, actually cause us not to trust again or not to trust so easily again. He might take a situation where we felt rejected And, you know, we might kind of start to think that maybe we're not loved or that we'll sort of shut down that kind of intimacy and closeness part of our heart because, you know, that situation just hurt too much. And you hear it, don't you? And and we can think about it in our own lives. Like, obviously, I'm using extreme examples here, but, you know, you hear it where someone's been hurt by church and then suddenly, actually... Just church in general is like, no way, not going there. Or we've been hurt by a leader or leadership, and then suddenly it's like, actually, we respond to authority or like, uh, you know, or positions of authority really badly because we just link it back to that situation where we've been desperately hurt in our heart. You know, and that's obviously the extreme, like you take one thing and then like everything becomes, you know, everything in that area becomes bad. But it can happen really subtly as well. You know, you can have a hurt in a relationship and actually it just subtly affects how you feel or, or like, what, you know, how you respond. And so if we go back to the picture of a mansion for a minute, I feel like, you know, when, when a relationship is, is hurt or something, it's like, it's like that door to that relationship gets closed. And you think, well, you know, it's just one relationship, it's just one friendship, and I've got loads of other friends, I've got loads of other relationships, and you can kind of keep it to sort of like that one bit of your heart. But actually, as we see, you know, it can sometimes seep into other areas, and then suddenly more doors get closed. And before you know it, a whole wing in your heart can be closed off because actually the hurt or the, the betrayal or the whatever has actually impacted more of your heart than just one tiny aspect. 
Ephesians 4, 26 to 27, it's a bit earlier in the passage, Paul says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. And as I was thinking about that passage, I was thinking, uh, you know, that obviously relates to anger and he's talking about anger. But I looked up the meaning of foothold and it says a place where a person's foot can be lodged to support them securely, especially while climbing. But it can also mean a secure position from which further progress may be made. And I think that when we're hurt, or when we do not forgive, we actually give the enemy a foothold in that area of our life. And it, it, he can take a situation and he actually can build on it because he's got a foothold, we've not forgiven, and actually it can spread out into other areas of our life. Our fellowship with God, as well as others, flows freely when we're willing to forgive. But it can get blocked by unforgiveness. And I don't know if you remember earlier this year we were talking about wells. I was speaking about wells and kind of corporately about what can block our wells as a church. And one of the things came up was, I think it was, um, we, we talked about busyness, um, but we also talked about unforgiveness. And I just, as I was preparing this, I thought, oh, we've kind of already been there, God. But I just felt like he, he kept bringing me back to say, actually, this is an area that, that you know, it's good, it's good for us to be looking at. It's good for us to be examining our hearts and working out whether there are any rooms that are closed in our hearts through hurt or through unforgiveness that are actually blocking our wells. Proverbs 4.23 says, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. Another translation says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Or guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it is the wellspring of life. And, you know, actually, we've had a number of talks about it, haven't we, about, like, the water flowing and, and the, you know, you think about a well and, and, like, water will, you know, will come out of it. But actually, the tiniest bit of contamination can actually contaminate the whole water supply. And Paul, uh, Pete Carter talked about it, didn't he? He sort of said, he, he held out the bottle of water and he said, you know, I've got this bottle of water, all good to drink. What happens... It makes everyone cringe when we say, what happens if I take this tiny, 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 tiny little bit of poo and I put it in the water? Shake it up. Do you want a drink? And of course we don't, because it can be the tiniest thing, can't it? But it can actually contaminate the whole water supply. And if our hearts are contaminated with unforgiveness or disputes, or resentment or bitterness, it starts to have an impact on our lives, on our relationships, on our relationship with God, it can, it can really impact us. And so I know we spent most of the time here on the heart, but I feel like it's really important. And, and uh, you know, I just feel like God is saying we need to have short accounts with our hearts. If something creeps in, we need to forgive quickly. If something hurts us, we need to be ready to kind of deal with it and respond and bring it to God. Because actually we all want healthy hearts. And we want our hearts to flow with life. And we want this well and the wellspring of life to just flow freely. And so we, you know, we just say, Holy Spirit, search our hearts and point out anything in us that might be holding us back. Because he wants to set us free as much as anything. He actually just wants to set us free. So that's the heart. Okay, we're going to whiz through the next, next few Okay, so the feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Say, say, the, um, say, have your feet fitted with the gospel of peace. Say that to your neighbor. The feet fitted with the gospel of peace. <laughs> now, I'm not going to spend a long time on this because we haven't got loads of time. But the main thing that I took away from this is I was looking at the, uh, the shoes that the soldiers wore um, Roman soldiers wore was that they were a bit like shoes that if you if you do any athletics or if you do if you play football how many footballers do we have in the room I know we have a lot of footballers in hope 
Um, the, the shoes that you wear for sport are shoes that have like either spikes or um, what they call cleats, aren't they, on, on the bottom of shoes. And what's the reason we have those? They're actually really to stop us from like sliding around, yeah? So if, you, if you're playing football, you obviously want to slide on the grass. If you're, if you're doing athletics, you want to be able to like get a really good grip on the, on the um, track, thank you, on the track. Uh, so that you can go as fast as you can, you can be as effective as you can. And um, with these, you know, just re you know, there's something about having your feet firm on the ground. So you dig your feet in. It says stand firm. It's not saying kind of like start to take a fight and like advance. It's actually just saying stand firm against the enemy. And he gives us these, these, um, these feet that can be secure in the ground. That means that when something comes, actually we will not. We won't, we won't slide, we won't come down, because actually we've got our feet fitted with the gospel of peace. So it'll give us the stability to stand firm. Okay, we're going to move on to the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, and we're going to look at those together. So, so the thing about the helmet that the... Um, that the soldiers wore was obviously it protected the whole of the head, but it also came down and there would often be bits over here so to protect the ears. Um, and it would, you know, it would be really solid and it would be really secure. And as I was thinking about the helmet of salvation, I was reminded of a verse in James 1, 12 that says, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Isn't that a beautiful image of the crown of life that will be put upon our head, that he promises to those who love him? And we wear that crown of salvation. When we give our lives to Jesus, we wear that crown of salvation. But there is something about the need for a helmet over that crown, because I really believe that the mind is a battleground for the enemy. And actually, as I was thinking about it, I was thinking there are some people here in this room for whom the mind really is a battleground. And the enemy knows it, and the enemy plays to it. And so for some of us, it's just patterns of negative thinking. I was thinking, you know, thinking it's funny how you can get into patterns of negative thinking, right? It's like if I get out of bed in the morning and I think, oh, this is going to be a bad day. And then you get up and you've kind of got in that, that in your mind. And you think this is going to be a really bad day. And then you go down and you burn the toast and you think this is really going to be a bad day. Then you, you burn the toast and then you kind of take it out on your husband, even though he didn't have anything to do with the toast. He's just standing there and he's got, you know, just got it in. The, he's standing in the crossfire. And you're like, this is going to be a re see, I told, I knew this, this was going to be a really bad day. And you go into work and actually it kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, doesn't it? Because you've kind of started, the, started in your mind, that actually, this is just going to be a bad day. And you think, actually, if you did that every single morning, if you woke up and the first thing you thought was, this is going to be a bad day, you're going to have a lot of bad days. Because actually, you start to think about something and it becomes a pattern. The opposite, you know, a bit of a funny one, although not good for my health. Funnily, at two o'clock in the afternoon, I used to think, oh, I really, really want a chocolate bar. And then the next day at two o'clock, I found that I thought, oh, I really want a chocolate bar. And it start, actually just became a habit that every single day at two o'clock, I thought, oh, yeah, I really fancy a chocolate bar. I had to break that negative mindset in my mind. <laughs> I had to break it. <laughs> No, I mean, but, but I'm, I am being serious. Like, actually, if we start to kind of allow negative thinking or negative thought patterns into our lives, actually, they're quite, they're quite difficult to break. And yet, actually, Jesus can break them. He can break them. And, you know, we, we looked a couple of weeks ago when I was preaching about, you know, how Romans talks about the renewing of our mind and how God can renew our minds. And so that's about kind of negative thinking. But I also felt like God was speaking about how actually lies 
can be really used as a strategy by the enemy to really take us down. Because the enemy loves to speak lies into our lives. Chris Vallotton told a story once of how he once saw, because he, he's a seer, so he, he then there was a whole period in his life where he saw a lot of spiritual stuff going on. And he, he walked into a restaurant one day or something, and, and he looked at a couple sitting at a table, and he actually saw a demon go and sit at the side of someone's head and say, she hates your guts. And then he went over to the woman and he whispered in the room that he's, and, and said, he thinks you're ugly. And then he just stood back and just saw this couple just argue using those, you know, those lies that they'd heard from the enemy. And whether it's a lie that we've struggled with because of experiences that we've explored in, in the heart, you know, we have bad experiences and then lies can come in and we can believe lies. Or it's a lie that we can believe just when we're feeling a bit tired or vulnerable. Or it's a lie that maybe actually we just don't, haven't even realized that we're believing a lie, but it's just this thing that we have in our lives that we haven't combated with the truth. And at times like this, we need to know and we need to use the weapon that God gives us, which is the sword of the Spirit. Now, when you think about sword, you might think of this like massive wielding sword that you can kind of wave around. But actually, the Roman soldier's sword was actually very small. It was kind of like a dagger. Um, but it was razor sharp. And because it was small, they could like get it out really quickly and they could use it really, really quickly in battle. And so actually it meant that it was one of the weapons that people you know, made them as a Roman kind of ar armory, like really formidable. You know, it's just like, whoa, they've got, they, they've got something they can use really quickly. It's really agile. They can get it out in, in, in kind of battle when they need it. And it will do the job, um, but it's quick and easy to use. And we need to use the word of God like this. You know, we need to have scripture at the tip of our tongues so that when a lie comes in, we can just bat it off and combat it with the truth. But we have to know our scripture to be able to do that. If you've been in situations where someone's been talking to you about a situation that's difficult, and actually you, you can just bring to mind some scripture that's like, actually, do you remember God says this? You know, you're worried about you know, provision or they're not being enough. And actually God says, you know, that, that, that he will provide and that we do not have to worry about a thing because he clothes the sparrows and the lilies of the field. And how much more does God love you that he will, he will give to you? You know, we need to know our scriptures to be able to be quick to recognize a lie and then to be quick to combat that lie with the truth. And we can do that for each other, can't we, as well? We don't just have to, we, so it was interesting because I hadn't, I hadn't heard it anywhere else, but some, I, had, I did hear some teaching about how the sword, the dagger, is obviously a weapon, but apparently could also be used to pick out the fiery arrows. Um, so you could use it to actually like pick out the arrow and get rid of it. And it's like we do need to use the word of God like that, don't we? When an arrow comes, we need to pick it out and flick it off. And we can do that for each other. So we're going to finish up now just with the, the shield of faith. And this, again, comes back to actually that we're called to wear the armor ourselves and use it to kind of do it individually for ourselves. Actually, we can help each other because in, in, a, um, in a battle, you don't, you're not just there on your own, are you? You're part of an army. You're part of an army. And you work together. And the shield of faith, you might think of a shield and you might think a small round shield, but actually these shields were absolutely massive. They were 1.2 meters high and about three quarters of a meter wide. So they absolutely covered a massive chunk of your body. And so, you know, when we, when we think about the shield of faith and our faith protecting us, we can actually think, you know, it will cover all of us. And just if you just scroll into the next. But the shield could be used like this. 
Um, for the Roman army, the shields would actually interlock and they'd be able to form this tortoise formation so that when they were advancing and they were advancing together, actually they were completely co like covered because their shields would interlock together. And I think this is a beautiful image of the fact that actually we are family. We're community. We're a community of believers. And when one of us is down, the others of us can help to protect and to, to shield them from things that kind of the enemy might be wanting to do in their lives. And it's a really beautiful image of the fact that actually, you know, we can, we can, be, we can be together. And so as we close, we're just going to look at the final bit of Ephesians. So we've, we've looked at that we're in a spiritual battle. Paul tells us that. He tells us the armor that we need to put on and that we need to stand firm in, that God equips us with those things to be able to stand firm. And he closes by saying, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And so I just want to close this morning just with a petition to you that if anything has spoken to you today, if there have been bits in the different bits of the armor as we've like looked at them and you thought, yeah, actually I recognize that in my life or that's something that, I, that has got in and actually maybe you know, I need to deal with to not give the enemy a foothold, then I'd really encourage you this morning to grab someone that you're close to, pray with them. We're going to have a ministry team. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll be there. I'll, I'll go and pray. I think there are a few others, and there's a whole ministry team who will, who will go and just, just come and get prayer because, you know, just like those shields and also just as, you know, Paul reminds us here, we need to pray for one another. We need to stand firm with one another, and we need to stand alongside each other in this journey of faith, in the good and the bad. And because we can, you know, we can see each other set free.